Now, when we were founded, we were founded as a quiet nation unto God. And we just sang the national anthem. And the national anthem uh, is a wonderful song. And through the words, you can see doctrine in those uh, words because of the freedom that we have as a client nation to God. And we are a client nation still today. And we might lose that in the future because there are uh, generations of people coming up who might not be interested in the Word of God. But I've got to tell you right now that there is nothing more important than the Word of God. Why else? Would uh, anybody stay up uh, uh, learning these things or studying these things unless it was important? And it is important. And I uh, stayed up to impart this to you, and I'm not bragging. I don't mean it to sound like I am bragging, but I'm trying to impart to you the importance of these things. And these things are important. They are extremely important. They're the most important things in your life and that's why we are going to have a conference in April and if you show up fine if not I'm still going to do it and I'm going to put it on tape because maybe someone in the future might understand the significance of these things and if you don't understand fine but somebody will understand the significance of these things and I'm going to be putting it on tape and it's been put on tape before by greater people than me because uh, I haven't been trained in Greek and Hebrew and things like that. But obviously, there's a purpose for me to be here. So I'm here, and I'm going to fulfill that purpose. And that's what I'm going to do. So up here on the top of this uh, uh, pulpit, that I, it says SOP. Somebody try to remind me that we have to go through a standard operating procedure. And we do. And it's very important. And I'm sorry I missed it last time, because, but maybe I was supposed to miss it so I could tell you how important it is. If you're not filled with God the Holy Spirit, you will never come to know the spiritual life. Pneumatikos, that is spiritual phenomenon. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit. And that's what the Bible says. And if you're not filled with God the Holy Spirit, you are going to yawn and you are going to play with your hands instead of learning the Word of God. So maybe we need to go through the standard operating procedure of naming your sins to God. Now I've been a little lax in the... This is a place of academics, really, when you think about it. We're studying things of the Word of God, and it has to be academic. And your behavior uh, uh, for this generation has been very good. But when you're dealing with academics such as this, such as the Word of God, it has to be utmost. I mean, it has to be perfect. I mean, you have to be so interested in what I'm teaching that you'll just write and write and write it down, and you will get it, and you will put it down in your notes. And it has to be important because... And that's how it gets in your soul when you do this. Now, uh, when I started on tapes, I would listen to tape after... Actually, I was 13 years old when I started to really get serious with tapes. Before that, I would listen, and my parents made me listen, for 30 minutes. They said, well, uh, you need to sit down and listen to this Bible tape for 30 minutes. And I would, and then go do my own thing whatever I had to do, go play with the neighbors, whatever, until I was 13. And then my parents, when I was 13 one day, decided, uh, I don't know what they were doing, but they had left. And I was there alone, and I had a box of Elijah tapes, and it was concerning Elijah. And I pulled out one of those tapes, and I put it in the tape recorder, and I pushed play, and I liked what I was hearing. So I heard one hour of that. And I liked it so much, I put in another tape. And I said, this is awesome stuff. And then I put in the third tape. And by the time the third tape was finished, my parents got back from what they were doing. And they came back and they said, what, what were you doing while we were gone? You know, they just wanted to know uh, uh, what I did uh, by way of conversation. And I said, I listened to these tapes here. 
and uh, they looked shocked. They had a, a, shock, a look of <laughs> shock on their face. But from then on, I listened every day to the Word of God. And then uh, my dad had a window washing business. So I worked with him in the window washing business every summer. And in the summer, I remember, he ordered the Jeremiah series. So I got Jeremiah, and I put it in the tape player and listened to it on my headphones as I washed windows. And I listened to uh, three, four, five, however many I could fit into a day of working, and that's what I would do. And uh, people were impressed that such a young person would be working, and uh, of course, but uh, what I was doing, I was uh, working and washing windows, and at the same time, I was listening to the Word of God. And this is how I know what I know today. It's from listening. And if you concentrate and listen under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, if you do not have the filling of God the Holy Spirit, you will not have that concentration. Maybe uh, there's a kink in your spiritual life. And you need to rebound a lot. And you need to say, no, no. for example, if you're bored, then that means that there's a kink. Because these are things, now I'm raising my voice. You should be very interested in what I'm saying by the way I'm speaking. And the fact that uh, if you're not, maybe there's a kink with you if you're not really interested. But you should be interested. Do you know how important it is? Maybe you don't, but it's important because do you know that within you, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son indwells each of us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit indwells us is something that did not happen in the Old Testament. It will not happen after the resurrection of the church. It will not happen in the tribulation. It will not happen in the millennium. These things will never happen again, and they're given to you in grace. So it's time that we wake up and realize that we have something phenomenal that we need to learn, and we need to learn these things. And right now we're studying sin, and there are a lot of sins that we know are, that you might know are not sins. I mean, you might think to yourself, well, these aren't sins, but they are. And we're going to be studying different sins in different categories and different trends of the old sin nature and other things. And we left off by studying the lust pattern of uh, your spiritual life. And I had written all these notes, and yet I haven't looked at them, and I've been just been talking off my head. So let's take a look at the notes. Uh, and there is a function to the lust pattern that uh, is destroy that will destroy your spiritual life. If you have a lust pattern, such as did I do the standard operating procedure? No. My goodness. <laughs> okay. So I thought I did. I thought I made a big point about it. I made a big point, but I didn't do it. <laughs> I need more sleep. All right, so uh, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And you're, right now you should be naming your sins to God if you got any that you need to name. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to study your word as we've been studying for over 35 minutes now. And we need to study your word and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may God the Holy Spirit give, a, give us the concentration that we need to learn these things. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. And I apologize for not doing the standard operating procedure. That's embarrassing to me, honestly. So, let's go with the function of the lust pattern in destroying your spiritual life. Point one. The lust pattern of the sin nature eliminates or destroys Bible doctrine as the number one priority in your life. Point one, the lust pattern of the sin nature eliminates or destroys Bible doctrine as the number one priority in your life. 
And, uh, for example, as I noted last time in the last message, if you're under the concept of approbation lust, you want people to have approval of you. And so the only thing you're concerned about is what people think of you. And that's not the way it should be. In the spiritual life, you are concerned with what God thinks. And when you are concerned with what God thinks, you are filled with God and the Holy Spirit, and you live the unique spiritual life. And the problem with churches today, all around this area, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches that I passed today on the way down 85, and not one of them teaches what I'm teaching here today. And they're not teaching what I teach because they don't understand the Word of God. And why don't they? Because they're focused on people. They want to have a friendship, and friendship is fine. That's the category two. And we'll get to these studies of friendship. Friendships are fine. And when you get married, that's a normal function of life. But the number one thing you should have in your life should be the Word of God because that is where happiness is. Happiness is found in the Word of God and nowhere else. You're not going to, well, you might have some times of pleasure with people eating chicken or whatever, uh, whatever you do with them after, and you'll have pleasure and laugh at their jokes. But that's not going to take you through a crisis when the crisis comes. For example, maybe one day the Chinese will attack the United, I don't know this, I'm just uh, making an assumption. Maybe one day the Chinese will attack these United States of America. And if they start to invade, what do you have? You're going to be eating chicken with all your friends from the church, and it doesn't mean a thing. But if you have doctrine in your soul, you'll be able to handle the coming disaster. Point two, lust destroys the believer's motivation to live the unique spiritual life. Lust destroys the believer's motivation to live the unique spiritual life. In other words, you lust after uh, having some type of social life instead of worrying about the Word of God. Well, then uh, you are in lust, and that's why your uh, spiritual life is not functioning. You need to have a spiritual life that functions, and lust is part of the destruction of that. And I picked out approbation lust, but you can have other lust. Maybe you have a sexual lust, and all you do all day is think about sex, and you want to have sex. And all you do is think about sex, and you go through the um, what's called autoeroticism, which is the same as masturbation. Or you go through that, and that's what you think about all day long. And if you do so, you are outside of the spiritual life. But you must be inside the spiritual life, and to be inside it means to name your sins to God. If you're involved in that, don't blush or don't do anything, and I'm not talking specifically to anyone. This is sta I wrote this last night, so it's not like I see you blush. You're not, I didn't notice anybody blushing. But it, it just uh, name your sins to God, and that's the way it works. Point three, lust is a distraction. And if you are distracted, you're not listening to the Word. For example, I wrote down here something about my dog, and that's because I was looking at my dog last night. My dog's name is Dakota. Now, uh, sometimes we let her outside to go to the bathroom. I let her outside when I go home sometimes. Lately, I've just gone straight to the computer and studied and waited for my wife to let the dog out. But uh, when, you let, when we let the dog out and uh, we watch her, and she walks around. Usually she's good about it, walks to the backyard and comes back, comes back inside the house. Uh, but sometimes she gets distracted. And when she gets distracted, she'll look over and she'll see somebody that she uh, has never seen before, and she loves people. And she looked up and she saw somebody she didn't know, and she took off running. Just boom! And I, say, I would say, Coda, come back! But she ain't listening to me. She's distracted. She's not listening to me. So when you're distracted from your lust pattern, you're not going to listen to the Word of God. You're going to run after that lust. For example, uh, if you have a lust for money, and now we've talked about the approbation lust, which is approval lust, but let's say you have a lust for money, and that doesn't mean you can't appreciate money. Uh, money is how we feed our bellies. Uh, money is important in our system of capitalism, but if you have a lust for it, if you lust for it, and that's all you do is think about making and acquiring money, and that's always on your mind, well, that's a lust, and you're not living the spiritual life because 
foremost in your mind should be the word of God. And that's what was on David's mind. He said, on thy word I meditate both day and night. And do you know that David was a mature believer when he was a teenager? That's right. And you say, now a lot of people look at teenagers and uh, they think down on them, but they shouldn't because, in fact, when you're a teenager, you can actually move quickly to spiritual maturity if you listen to the Word of God and if you put it in your soul. You can grow up and move to spiritual maturity as a teenager. And in fact, you can exceed the status of your parents. Now, you would never make an issue of it as a teenager. You would never say, ha, 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 mom and dad, I'm more mature than you. That would mean you're not very mature. So uh, that's not the way it would work. But uh, as a teenager, you can actually become a mature believer, and that's what David did. And David's father and mother were idiots. David's father was an idiot. He was busy in approbation lust, approval lust. He wanted to get approval from the king by sending him some cheese, and he sent him some cheese, and he sent him some wine, and he did other, other things such as this to get the approval of the king. But little did he know that his own son was going to be the king, and he wasn't king through approbation lust. He wasn't king through approval lust. He became king because of his love for the Word of God. And if you have a love for the Word of God, you will have an impact on this country, just as David had an impact on his country. His cup overflowed with the Word of God. And if your cup overflows, you have an impact on your country. And, and right here, these few people sitting here in Anderson, South Carolina, we can have an impact on Anderson. In fact, Anderson, uh, through the impact of some mature believers, might grow to be as big as Houston. You never know. I mean, you never know how it's going to work. Houston was a little hole in the wall until Bracket Church got found, and now it's the fourth largest city in America. Well, this little place called Anderson could grow if there's positive volition here. If there's not, then our country's going under. It's our last chance, basically. This right now, what I'm telling you right now, it is our last chance. And I'm telling you this because people get offended by the littlest of things. They get offended in their hypersensitivity. They get offended by what I say from the Word, or they get offended by something else, and they uh, leave or do what they want, and that's their choice. But it's not a time to be offended. It is not a time to um, uh, 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 make importance out of ourselves. It is a time to make the Word of God important. The Word of God is important. It is the most important thing ever. And that's why in April we're going to have a conference in which we stuff doctrine into our souls. And if you show up, you will get that chance. If not, it's your choice, but it's going to be on tape. Maybe somebody else in some other part of the country will stuff it in their souls. Who knows? We don't know how these things work. Now, we don't know who's positive and who's negative. It's not for us to judge, but it does. It can occur that people get a hold of this. Maybe uh, if this church fails, they'll get a hold of the tape and go on to the colonel and grow up and uh, listen to the colonel and grow up spiritually, and then the country might be saved by just a few more people who have decided to learn the Word of God. And that's wonderful. And there's a purpose for me being here, and that is to teach you, and that's what I'm doing. So, point four, lest divorces uh, the believer from, the, from reality. Now, when my dog was uh, running down the street, we have a, a southern thing that we do. It's, it's unique to the south. You know what you do when uh, a baby's doing something wrong, or if a animals doing something wrong, you say, eh! and then the dog, it, it's an amazing thing that works, because usually, if the dog's taking off running, and you go, eh! and then the dog will stop, and, uh. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a stun gun, almost, it's, a, it's unreal how that works, eh! and then uh, the dog stops and looks at you, but in this case, the dog was distracted, took off running, I said, eh, he didn't care, she didn't care, she just kept running. So, 
Uh, that's and we do that with children. Uh, a little two-year-olds, uh, they like to mess with stuff, checking things out, and you go, <coughs> and then the two-year-old, huh? And that's the way it works. And that's the way we do it in the South. And it's uh, maybe we're smarter than the Yankees. You get that? <laughs> All right. So lust divorces the believer from reality, and this is point four. And if you remain under lust for an extended period of time, it can directly lead to the daisukos believer. What's daisukos? That's found in James. That means you're double-minded. It leads to mental illness. If all your life you are distracted from the Word of God, eventually you will move into mental illness. And now, I'm, that's not saying there are some mental illnesses that occur by biology. You can have some uh, type of uh, uh, disease from biology. Uh, for example, ne neurosyphilis. You could be born with that, and then it destroys your brain, and uh, it's not your fault. You were born that way. Or you could have uh, lupus. Lupus can affect the brain, and that's not your fault. But there is mental illness that occurs because of the, the decisions that you have made. And if you made a decision to live constantly under the old sin nature, and you've made decisions constantly to be divorced from reality, then it can lead to mental illness, as James says in Daisukos, point five. Point five, lust turns the believer into a tricky and deceitful person. And this is under the study of sin, that lust turns the believer into a tricky and deceitful person. Point six, lust destroys the believer's motivation to glorify God. And it turns the believer's motivation into self-promoting motivation. In other words, somebody who's functioning under lust all the time without functioning under the filling of God the Holy Spirit will become a user. And that's what they are called in the Scripture. They're like a leech. They uh, latch on to you because they think you're going somewhere in life. And they latch on to you and they suck your blood as a user. And there is no place for users in the spiritual uh, in the unique spiritual life or in the Christian way of life. There's no need for that. Well, why are you latching on to somebody because you think they're going to uh, uh, get you ahead or you rely on somebody? Well, that's part of approbation lust as well. And people in approbation lust get involved in this as well. And that is the fact that you become a user of people. You, uh, for example, in high school, you see somebody who is popular and you say... Uh, this person over here is real popular. I want to have uh, that many people like me too. So you try to associate yourself with the popular person. And what that is is lust. And what you're doing is you're making yourself a user. You're like a leech. You know, just relax when it comes to people. Who cares? Who cares if somebody likes you or not? I don't care. I really don't give a darn. And I was going to say something else, but I'll say, darn. All right. So by way of review, we commit sins that are both sins of cognizance and sins of ignorance. And we studied that earlier. And we are counted guilty for both types of sin. Now we're going to look at uh, sin at, at a different angle. And we're going to look at sin. There are four categories of sin. And this is what we're going to look at. There are four categories of sin. And if you're not tired, I'll continue. Actually, if you are tired, I will continue. <laughs> All right. The first type is emotional sins. We have emotional sins. And that is sins related to fear. Point one. In emotional sins, we have sins related to fear. Now, one time, uh, my parents and I were flying to I believe it was Oregon. It had to be Oregon because that's the farthest west I've been. We were flying to Oregon, and we got over the Rocky Mountains. And what happens in, in the Rocky Mountains is what I showed you on Tuesday night with the ridge here. I had a ridge up here. Well, uh, in the summertime, this ridge, the wind blows up the ridge, and the uh, air condenses and cools, and it forms thunderstorms. So they have terrible thunderstorms 
over the Rocky Mountains. And we were flying over that at about 35,000 feet. And we got in the top, the very top of one of these thunderstorms. It looked pretty smooth, you know, just a lot of high cirrus clouds. But it was windy up there because the air was rushing upward from pushing up from the mountains. So the wings of the plane were going blah, 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 like that. And I looked out the window and I said, Hey, Dad, it looks like that uh, wing out there is going to uh, snap off. And we just had a good laugh out of it. But the lady behind me was terrified, and I didn't know that. I wouldn't have said anything if I had known she was so terrified of flying. And uh, she looked at it, and she gripped onto that and just... <clears throat> now, that's not going to help her. If we were to spin into the earth, she's going to die whether she grips onto that or not. So you see, the sin of fear is irrational. I mean, she got scared. She was in there and just gripped onto that. Now, if all of a sudden the wing were to rip off and we spun into the earth, her gripping onto that is not going to help. We're all going to die, you know. So it's irrational. You know, she shouldn't have been scared, but she was, and I felt bad for making her so scared by saying the wing is about to rip off. I knew it wasn't, but it was just, uh, I was just having fun. You're flying, blah, 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 just flying along. It's a long flight out there, so I was trying to have some fun, and, and she didn't appreciate it. And I could see her handprints. No, I couldn't. I'm joking. <laughs> All right, so point two, there are sins related to hatred, and that includes anger, violence, and murder. Sins related to hatred, which includes anger, violence, and murder. And for some reason, a lot of Christians don't believe that anger is a sin. And it is a sin. And I don't know why uh, that's been the case, but I've run into people and they get angry and they just seem to uh, justify it. I have a right to be angry. And I would say, well, it's a sin to be angry. And they say, no, it's not. And then they quote, be angry and, and not sin. And we'll study that in more detail later. And... Uh, that deals with other things, be angry and not sin, in Ephesians. And we will study that. And then we have point three, sins related to self-pity. That is, you feel sorry for yourself. Maybe you feel sorry for yourself because you've been sitting here for so many hours and you don't want to be sitting here, and you would rather be doing something else. So that is sins related to self-pity. And if that's the case, I feel sorry for you, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> and then we have sins related to guilt. And guilt is a sin. And that is important uh, because a lot of times we commit sins that shock ourselves. We're shocked by what we do. Maybe we should be shocked by what we do. Maybe you should be shocked that you're not interested in the Word. You see, that's what you should be shocked with. Instead, you're shocked with some sin you commit. Yes, the most important thing to do is to learn Bible doctrine. What pleases the Lord? Doctrine in your soul. What displeases the Lord? Doctrine not in your soul. So you commit a sin. You say, I have displeased the Lord. Uh, maybe so by way of anthropopathism. But if you have doctrine in your soul, you're pleasing the Lord. And that's when, when we get to the Bema seat, which is the uh, judgment after the resurrection of the church, the Lord will say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. And if you hear those words, you have heard something phenomenal from our very Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yet if you stand before the Bema seat and he says, What have you done with the unique spiritual life that I've given to you? and you have nothing to answer for it, you will be ashamed, ashamed before the Lord. You believe in Christ, and you're going to be in heaven, but you're going to be ashamed at that moment, and it's going to be a terrible moment for you because you have the opportunity right now to grow up spiritually. Take it. Take that opportunity. Don't let anyone take your crown from you. If you're worried about what people think, you're letting someone take your crown. Keep your crown. Grow up spiritually. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior. It's important. It's important to you. And I spit a lot, and I'm sorry, but it's important. Not that I spit. The doctrine is important. The next category of sins, I noticed you were looking at all the spit flying out. That's why I said something. That's why we said so far, man. <laughs> 
so we're going to go with, um, we just finished up with emotional sins. And now we're going to go to mental sins. And mental sins would be, I wish this jackass would shut up and go home. That would be a mental attitude sin. So we have point one. <laughs> I'm sorry if I said jackass. Some of you might never... Have you never heard that word before? <laughs> Come on now. You watch television. <laughs> Just because I'm up here behind a pulpit doesn't mean anything... Ho oh, this big light coming out of my head. Oh, yeah. I shall never say the word jackass. Oh, no, that's not what it's about. That's not what it's about at all. I'm trying to teach you something here. You watch television, they cuss every other word on television. And jackass, that's not even a cuss word. That's a donkey. It's called a Democrat. Okay. But I'm not getting into politics. But a donkey is a Democrat, and they are jackasses. All right. So we're getting into the category of mental attitude sins. So we have point one. There is arrogance. Arrogance is a mental attitude sin. And then we have point two, which is pride. And that's a mental attitude sin. And we have point three, jealousy, which is a mental attitude sin. And I'm going slow for those of you who are listening on a tape. And I know there are some who do because Gary told me there are some listening on tape. So if you're listening on tape, I'm going slow for your benefit too. Uh, maybe you should be taking note two on tape. So three, jealousy. And then four, implacability. There is implacability. And five, there is bitterness. And six, vindictiveness. And you say, what is vindictiveness? Look it up in Webster's. They have a good definition, and it has to do with revenge. If you look it up in the dictionary, it has to do with revenge motivation and all of those things. And you say, why don't you say revenge then because you need to build a vocabulary you think with vocabulary i cannot speak without vocabulary i could say hey man what you doing and and just amen hallelujah all day but i don't have a vocabulary you need a vocabulary and point six is vindictiveness and if you don't know what it means look it up in the dictionary and then point seven is inordinate and i'll go ahead for, with no extra charge and tell you that means excessive inordinate means excessive, I-N-O-R-D-I-N-A-T-E, ambition and competition. And I know that when I listened to the colonel, he would say inordinate ambition and competition over and over and over again, and I didn't know what he was saying until one day I said, you know what, I want to know what he's saying, so I looked it up in the dictionary, and I realized it was excessive. And he has a large, or had a large vocabulary. He's having trouble now. But it's important that we all... Uh, build over our, our vocabulary, and that's important to our spiritual life. So I won't torture you anymore today as it's a Sunday and you might want to do something else. I don't know why, but you might. And um, I'm going to go do something else myself and go to sleep. <laughs> and on uh, Tuesday, I'll be back here. And on Tuesday, I'll make an announcement whether we can be here on Wednesday because I've got so much stuff to give you. And in fact, uh, I didn't get to where I wanted to go, and it's frustrating for me that I didn't get that far. Uh, but I got off subject a couple times and started yelling and spitting, and maybe that's my fault. But uh, you have to understand, before I let you go, I want you to understand that right now we're at a critical stage in our nation's history. We're at a critical stage because uh, the greatest Bible teacher since the Apostle Paul has fallen ill, and he is sick right now. And I just got a, an update on Colonel Thame uh, the other day. And it says about Colonel Thame that he's in the same condition. He's still frail, and, but uh, what was said on there was that his prayers are still lucid, very understandable, and he's still uh, enjoying himself in life. And it actually said he is very appreciative for all the prayers that have been given to him, and it said he is very appreciative uh, for the fact 
of other things, and he's actually he's very appreciative to God for his spiritual life. Now, a lot of his neurons have been burned up through old age, as might happen to all of us, and it's a very sad thing to see the greatest believer since the Apostle Paul go through these things. But it's a motivation to me, and it should be a motivation to you as well, a motivation to learn these things of the Word of God. Now, Colonel Thame was my human mentor, and I have no uh, reservations about saying that. Now, I looked up a lot of pastors who, uh, on the Internet, uh, the other day Gary came over, and uh, we looked up some of these pastors on the Internet, and they would use the colonel's terminology and then turn around and criticize him. And I was, uh, you're using his terminology. What are you doing? You're criticizing him on the basis of his own terminology, and they would do that out of arrogance. Well, this I'm not arrogant. I'm, I'm going to be humble about it, and I'm going to tell you everything that I have ever gotten is from the colonel. And if this church never makes it, it may not. It may. It may grow tremendously, or it may not. It depends on the positive volition of people around here. If people want to hear the word, they'll show up. But if people don't want to hear the word, they won't be here. And that's the way it goes with positive and negative volition. So, if this church fails, I would just tell you to stick with the colonel. Stick with his tapes. He has so many tapes. I mean, how many? 11,000, I believe. I got a lot in uh, maybe uh, 15,000. I got a lot in my house uh, that's up against the wall. They used to be under a house. But now they're up against the wall in my house, and we'll have to find some storage from them when we move. But uh, I have lots of tapes, lots and lots of tapes, and that's where I got it from. I'm under no illusions of where I came from. I came from listening to Colonel Thame. Now, I listened a lot. I listened a lot. That's why I'm able to get up here and uh, cite for you from memory many doctrines. That's because that's who I lived uh, under was the colonel. And if you want to listen to the colonel, I, I wish you would, because it's our only hope as a nation. Our nation is in trouble. You might not know it, but it is. And that's why September 11th occurred. It's because our country is in trouble. And uh, God is giving us a, a time to be graced out. He's saying, all right, I warned you with September 11th, and now I'm giving you some time to turn to the word. But it's not happening. This church should be overflowing with what I'm giving you. My goodness, this isn't taught anywhere. Anywhere today it's not. Now it might, it's taught in some churches who they have uh, gone under the colonel. And um, I'm not going to be arrogant and say that. But in some places who have come out of the colonel do teach these things. But in terms of South Carolina, you won't find a church like this one. You won't find a church where a pastor will stand up and teach for two hours in 20 minutes. It will not occur. Now, we had a break, so I'll just uh, be honest and say two hours, uh, two hours even. You won't find it. You won't find it out there today. You'll find social life. People go to church today and have a social life. Where's the social life going to get you? And you say, well, I want my children to be around other children. And I'm pretty sad that there's no children here, and uh, they need to have a social life. Why? Why? I didn't. I never went to church, per se. I went to church every night on a tape, and my social life was just fine. Actually, my social life was better than others. I didn't get involved in drugs. I didn't, do, I didn't uh, go nuts with a social life, and why not? I had doctors. Why didn't I do that? Because of why didn't I get rebellious? Doctrine. And what you need as young people is doctrine. You need to understand the Word of God. And you don't need a social life. You might have a social life, and that's fine. But the, the Word of God should be the most important thing in your life. And I'm not telling you to be a hermit and to go in your house and just whatever. But with the Bible doctrine, uh, you'll be able to enjoy your social life. And you know how it goes in social life. There's jealousy involved in it. Jealousy is a sin. We haven't got to that yet. But jealousy is a sin. And when you get in social life, uh, somebody who's supposed to be your friend is uh, being friends with somebody else. And then you get jealous. Well, that's part of sin. 
and in the spiritual life you can enjoy yourself you can say oh well so what that person's making a good friend good for that person I have the spiritual life I'm going to go on and live it and uh, people who think that church is for so church is not for social life it was never designed that way the apostle Paul study studied and teached and he studied and teached and he studied and he taught and he did this uh, because uh, in social life never was a big thing for the apostle Paul except one time and he got in trouble for that because one time he decided he wanted to have a social life with the legalist and you don't know what a legalist is but we're about to study that and I should be studying it as it's part of uh, lesson 14 yet I haven't even got through lesson 13 so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed Father we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning and this afternoon to study your word may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us may God the Holy Spirit make these things perspicuous to us so that we can understand the things that we have studied and uh, may we come to glorify you so that we might move to play Roma to Theu, and that means a fullness of blessing from God. And when we move to a fullness of blessing from God, we can have an impact on our country, on our community. We can have an impact on the county of Anderson, the city of Anderson, the state of South Carolina, and these United States of America. Through our unique spiritual life, we can grow in grace and in knowledge and have our cup overflow in which we will be a blessing to all those around us including our nation and that's a wonderful <coughs> thing in grace that you have given us father and i'm very thankful for it and we pray father that there is, that if there is anyone in the area that wishes to hear the gospel they might show up here so they can get the gospel and if anyone around the area desires Bible doctrine, I know, excuse me, I know that you will send them here to listen to Bible doctrine. And if there's not, well, the church will never grow, and it will uh, we'll eventually close our doors, and I'll say, go hear the tapes. But that's up to your will. And even your will cannot overcome free volition, because people around the area have free volition. If they want to listen, they'll come and listen. If not, they will reject it and go their own way. And so, we thank you, Father, for the privilege we had as people who really wished to learn the Word of God. And we thank you for the fact that we were able to listen to the Word of God today as we are privileged as citizens of the United States. And Father, I do pray thee that you do not take that privilege away from us that you hold out the fifth cycle of discipline on us and to remember um, Isaac who later became Israel remember him so that uh, we might remember those people who are growing in grace and when they reach Pleroma to Theu there might be a holding back of the storm clouds of the fifth cycle and we understand it's coming Father we understand the urgency of it and may God the Holy Spirit enlighten us in Christ's name we ask it Amen.